Welcome to Red Team TV, sponsored by Red Team Thinking. Bad leaders react, good leaders plan, and great leaders think. Each week, we bring you new ideas and insights from business leaders, military leaders, and thought leaders. Ideas and insights that will help you think more deeply and lead more effectively, so that you can better navigate your complex world. Here again are your hosts, best-selling business author and top-rated leadership speaker Bryce Hoffman, and former Royal Air Force Wing Commander and Business Agility Coach Marcus Dimbleby. Hello and welcome to the show. I am Bryce Hoffman, president of Red Team Thinking and author of the book Red Teaming. As always, I am joined by... Good day, Marcus Dimbleby, vice president, Red Team Thinking. Very excited to be back again on the show. And this week, what are we going to be talking about, Bryce? Well, Marcus, I thought that we would continue our conversation that we started a couple weeks ago about the three C's. And as I explained then... The three C's are are clarity, capability, and culture. And these are the things that that we try to help organizations develop through red team thinking. I was thinking we would continue the conversation we started a couple of episodes ago about the three C's. Now, the three C's, as you may remember, stand for clarity, capability, and culture. And these are the three things that we try to help organizations develop through red team thinking. And as we explained in that episode, clarity is really the first step to creating a red team culture. Because if you don't have an ability to look honestly at yourself, at your organization, you can't make good decisions because you're not addressing the challenges that you're actually facing. And unfortunately, as we talked about, too many organizations, I honestly think all organizations, create, and there's just no polite way to say this, create a fog of BS around themselves that is made up of comforting lies that they tell themselves, that we tell ourselves, that are designed to insulate us from the hard truths, the painful truths, the difficult truths that we don't want to deal with. And so we talked about how you could use red team thinking to cut through that fog of BS and get at the truth and and to see the right way forward, to see the challenges and opportunities so that you can address them. But here's the thing. Even if you can see clearly, if you can't act on that knowledge, what good does it do you? If you don't have the tools and the techniques and the skills that you need to make really effective strategic decisions, to plan effectively and to execute effectively, then that clarity is of really no value. So that's why the second C is capability. And by capability, we mean cognitive capability, the ability to think critically, the ability to overcome groupthink and think for ourselves, the ability to surface the best ideas regardless of where they are in the organization, regardless of where they are in the org chart, regardless of who has them, what they look like, what their management level is, and make sure that the best ideas win. And so that's what we mean when we talk about capability. And it's so essential today. Absolutely. I posted an article this week that I'd seen in LinkedIn had been talking to Google to say, how, how do you guys recruit so many people? You know, they have 2 million applicants and 200,000 jobs that they go through every year. And they were talking about one of the key things they look for is this cognitive skill set that's lacking, as we know, in so many organizations. And I think it was it October 2020, the World Economic Forum, they put out a future of job survey. And the most essential skills that came out, the top thing was critical thinking, followed by analytical thinking, then creativity, problem solving, self-management, I'm just reading the list here, working with people, management and communication of activities. All these are what we call soft skills. And because of that name, they've almost been kicked, kicked in the gutter, kicked to a side. They're not given the real focus that the hard skills, the technical training that we normally interview for, we normally fill our CVs and resumes up with. And these soft skills, though, as you mentioned, are really essential for going forward. In this very complex and dynamic world we're living in, we have to be able to use these cognitive capabilities to allow us to 
both understand, provide that clarity for ourselves, but understand what's going on around us from both situational awareness, self-awareness, and I think more importantly, awareness of what others are thinking and feeling and how they're behaving in a certain way. Absolutely. And there's really, to me, there's three elements of, of how we provide that cognitive capability. One is, is, as you said, to engage critical thinking, which is so fundamental and so basic and yet is so lacking today. There's been so many surveys done by the Wall Street Journal, by Bloomberg, by others that ask business leaders, CEOs, what is, what is the thing that is most lacking in the new employees that you're hiring? And for years, for years, basic critical thinking skills has scored really high on that list because unfortunately, Colleges and universities don't do a good job, generally speaking, about teaching these skills anymore. They used to do a better job. If you go back far enough, in some places in the world, even 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 secondary schools taught some of these skills. But it's just it's all been yeah. replaced by you know, as you say, that the, you know, focus on technical skills, focus focus on professional and technical capabilities, but ignoring the the fundamentals of applied critical thinking. So that's one. Number two is to enable distributed decision making because if you give people that basic level of critical thinking capability they can think for themselves they can make decisions in the field which you can then trust them to do because you know they've got those skills and that's so critical because today with things changing as rapidly as they are with the hyper connectivity of the world that we've talked about in the past you need to drive decision making as close to the coal face, as close to the front line as possible. And this is true in business and it's true in the military. One of the biggest focuses of leadership thinking in the US military for the past several decades is to figure out how to drive decision making to the lowest echelon possible. Because that's such an enabler of agility with a lowercase a, agility in the battlefield, agility during operations. And so you can only do that if you have the basic critical thinking skills that those frontline leaders need to be able to think and act for themselves. And then finally, number three is encouraging diversity of thought. Because as we've talked about previously, there's a lot of lip service paid today to this idea of diversity and inclusion. But that diversity and inclusion doesn't do you much good if the people that you're bringing in aren't listened to, aren't heard, aren't able to share their alternative perspectives, which is the value that diversity brings. Absolutely. And I think just to unpick those three levels, going back to, you know, engaging critical thinking, this is a core skill, as you said, it's massively lacking. We're seeing this in many sectors, many organizations. And the problem is most people think they think critically. It's a default human nature that we all think we're rational and we all think we think critically. Now, we may have thousands of thoughts a day, but they're not critical thoughts. And to think critically, you physically have to engage your brain. And to do that takes effort and skill to, and understanding to do that. And that's why we have to take you know, the, these techniques and tools that we bring to the table, allow that to happen. And when you do it, you see how difficult it actually is to do but very simple once you understood that process. Well, this goes to Daniel Kahneman's uh, system one, system two thinking. And as, as we learn from Kahneman and other cognitive scientists, you know, system one, for those who aren't familiar, is, is intuitive and instant. So, you know, we don't need to think about when we see a flame. We don't need to think about whether it's hot or might burn us. We just know that intuitively, instinctively, and we can react Whereas system two thinking is what we generally think of as thinking. It's it's effortful, yeah. it's hard, and it requires you to engage your brain. And as Kahneman and other scientists have proven in thousands and thousands of experiments, the problem is the problem with our brains is that they're lazy. And so often when we think we're using system two thinking, to your point, when we think that we're thinking, we're really letting system one thinking take over as I can't remember the philosopher who said this, I'll find it and put it in the notes. But many times people mistake, think they're thinking when actually all they're really doing is rearranging their prejudices. Wow. 
Wow, that's a powerful statement, isn't, isn't it? it? I, and, and it's so true. And this goes back to why this is such an important core skill and why so many employers are looking for this today. And it's so important because in today's complex world, we can't afford to be applying system one thinking. Absolutely. That intuition, that gut reaction, we can't do that anymore because of the complexity, the volatility. We have to do this stop and think, this ability to slow down, to engage this capability that we don't have. But then once we've got that capability, is how we then apply that to slow down, to get that effortful, effortful thought process coming in so we get a better outcome and decision. And that's that first skill set needed. The second one you talked about, this devolved decision making, what that's doing is allowing the executive leaders to hand off control. And we all complain in organizations, all the people we work with, oh, it's a command and control organization. We're not allowed to do anything. We're not empowered. Executives want to hand off control, but there's that lack of trust. And because there's a lack of trust, they don't hand off control. It's that vicious circle. But if they enable their people with these skills, these capabilities, and see them growing, then it's like anything is it when you trust someone to do something because you know they're capable of doing it, then you're allowed personally to hand off and feel comfortable in doing so. So that gives you that devolved decision making. And it's hilarious. I've seen with in the world of agile, big A, in agile allows autonomous self organizing teams. So I've seen organizations where they stand up agile at the coal face, all of their teams are hashtag quotes agile and they hand off all this control because they believe them to be self-sustaining and self-organizing and then absolute chaos ensues because the teams aren't capable and the fact you just change somebody's name over the weekend and give them a new title doesn't mean they're <laughs> capable and there's mayhem they're going but i thought we were all agile i thought we were all autonomous but they like, got a badge they got a digital exactly, badge exactly but where's the clarity of what they're supposed to be doing? It's not there. Where's the skills and the capabilities to deliver these things you need? They're big things. Oh, yeah. I thought they had that from no. Don't think. Actually, critically think. And then the final one, diversity of thought. Wow, we, we can unpack this one all day, can't we? That's a skill. It's not only a skill having diversity of thought as an individual. It's a skill for me as a leader to enable that capability. You know, if, if you're savvy enough to bring the right people from different backgrounds, diverse experiences together and then unleash them to yep. think in this way, wow, that's a powerhouse. And, and we see this so often, don't we, with our clients where you, and, you know, we help them bring together a diverse group for the reason that when you get them together and let them do these things with these tools and these techniques, then you get absolute gold every single time. And the way we do it is so simple because we have an array of tools, very simple tools that we call liberating structures. And these are tools that use anonymity often or are just even, even simple ways of, of, of communicating that are designed to, as I said earlier, ensure that everyone's voice is heard and that everyone's idea is considered independently of the person who shared it. Because... Unfortunately, we all are prejudiced. We all have biases. And I don't just mean about race or gender, but just, you know, someone who who, who is well-dressed and very attractive is more likely to be listened to than someone who is disheveled and, 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 and you know, not very attractive. And that's just a fact. And it's such an important fact that at times when the British military is doing red teaming analyses of really important plans, really important strategies. They have been known to have a group of people on their, on their red team take and rewrite the plan to break it down into a series of bullet points before it's analyzed for the simple reason that they are worried that if someone's a really good writer, a really eloquent wordsmith, that that may make that plan look better than it actually is. Or if someone's really not a very good writer, it may make their plan look worse than it is. So it's really important to give people tools that they can use to evaluate ideas objectively. So that's one thing. And liberating structures, which we have several of, are, are a great way to do that. An example of a liberating structure, a simple one, a real simple one, one of the most simple ones that we teach. And this is a tool that is taken from the world of stand-up comedy, but it's so powerful that the U.S. Army has adopted it 
as a, as a tool that they teach to to officers who are going to be red team leaders is called yes and and it this is how simple it is you you get people who you're you're working on a problem you're working on an issue and you you get people to to sit in a circle and or sit around a table then have to be a circle and the first person shares their thought i think that the problem we're dealing with is x and therefore we should do y now most people's initial reaction to that is is going to be to say either oh yeah that's a really good idea i agree or eh, i'm not sure I, I i'm not sure i agree with that no um, but no but no but that one. yeah no, no but. but so the rule of yes and is simple you're not allowed to say no but and you're not a, now allowed to simply nod your head you have to say yes and you have to build on the previous idea you have to iterate you hear a lot about iteration it's a big part of like design thinking and Huge. stuff and yet this is a simple way to to kind of jumpstart this this iterative process. So the second person says yes, and I think we could also do B. And the third person then says yes, and another reason we should do A and B yeah. is Z. And you build and then go around the group like that, and it's amazing. Yeah. It's such a simple thing, but it's amazing how that changes the dynamic, how that changes the conversation. Because it disrupts the hierarchy, it disrupts the power structure, and it forces people to kind of listen to each other and and build on each other. So it's a very engaging process. So much. And, and you're getting what we call a twofer with that, because you mentioned there, active listening. Yes. Because these people, while they're all speaking, the rest of them are silent and actively listening to think about what they're going to say and how they're going to build on that. And what we're starting to do now is source the wisdom of the crowd you're using this diversity of the people in the room and each person is triggering the next person to think about something as and helping them trigger that thought. So you're constantly building. Before it gets to you, you may not even know what you're going to say, but because of what's the preamble to arriving at your point, your brain is now building on what's being triggered from the individuals before you. So it's a really powerful capability. And I was just thinking earlier when we're talking about this capability, you know, if you're a leader or a manager, or in any way, shape, or form responsible for a number of people, do you have the capability to enable them to do this? Do you have the capability for this group of people to come to you with great ideas, to challenge you, to speak up, to have great discourse with each other, and good dialogue to get these suggestions, to get this innovation flowing like it's a daily capability? Because if you don't, that's something you should really stop and think about. And as Bryce talked about, these liberating structures these tools and techniques that we have are so simple, you know, quick to learn, immediate efficacy, and really quick, powerful outcomes and outputs. Not just for you as a leader, but also for those receiving and then getting to use them and see the value of them through the engagement. And, and again, that's just a really, really simple tool. Then we have more powerful tools, more robust tools that are designed to really give you the cognitive capabilities that we were just talking about. So we break those into three broad categories. Gosh, we like a lot of threes. We do. It's, 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 the troika it's, in us. The troika, yeah, yeah. Good things come in threes. So in this case, we have three categories of tools. The first are what we call analytical techniques. And these are things like one of my favorite tools, Assumptions Challenge, which is designed to take a plan, take a strategy, Take a decision even that you're contemplating and break it down into the assumptions that it's based on and then challenge those assumptions in a structured and deliberate way to make sure they're as strong as they could be. And if they're not strong enough to either figure out how to modify the plan so it's less dependent on weak assumptions or to create contingency plans, mitigating actions that you can take if those assumptions prove untrue during the execution. So that's what we call analytical techniques. And then we have another category of tools that we call imaginative techniques. And imaginative techniques, as the name implies, are about, you know, kind of using our creative brain to think about the problem, the plan, or the strategy that we're working on. And an example of this, well, again, one of my favorites is pre-mortem analysis, which was developed by Dr. Gary Klein. He was a guest on our podcast previously will have him back on the show 
um, again, I hope. And pre-mortem analysis, which is an amazingly powerful technique, as the name implies, is about thinking about how your plan could fail, imagining what failure looks like before you execute your plan so that you can modify it to decrease the chances of that imagined failure happening. And it's based on this idea that, that, that Gary had, which is so powerful that, you know, postmortems are great. It's great to look at why your plan failed and then learn from that so you don't make those same mistakes again. But wouldn't it be better if you could do that analysis up front so the failure actually never happens in the first place? Better and a lot less painful as well. A lot less painful. Yeah. And that's why it's called pre-mortem. And then the final category, the third category, for those who are keeping count, is contrarian techniques, which are really designed to look at a problem from multiple angles to force us to play the devil's advocate and look at what other options we could consider that we're ignoring, what could be wrong with our plan, where the weak spots could be, to really stress test it and make sure that our plan is the best plan. And my favorite tool in this category, because I invented it, is Devil's Troika, which as you said, we love our we love our troikas, our threes. Okay. And Devil's Troika is a tool that's that's designed, you know, people talk about devil's advocacy and it's a great concept, but it's not really clear how you do it. And often the way that people play the devil's advocate is very ineffective. So this is a technique that requires everyone to both play the devil's advocate and to iterate again on each other's ideas so that you're both having a positive and a negative take on everything. And out of that comes a synergetic solution that's more powerful than, than anyone's individual idea. And it's, it's an amazing technique. We've used it with so many companies, with so many government organizations, with so many militaries around the world. Um, very recently with NATO, and uh, the results were just tremendous. And they were so amazed at how quickly they could use this capability to develop plans, to develop strategies. And you want, you want to share that story, Marcus, actually, because I think it really gets to this issue of the capability that we're talking about with the second C. Yeah, absolutely. When we did this with the NATO headquarters, literally took about 90 minutes. We brought a very diverse group into the room, gave them a problem to analyze, didn't have the big senior general in there, the admiral himself, let the guys get on with it. Guys and gals, because it was a diverse group. Guys and gals, it was indeed. Sorry, collective guys for the UK here. But yeah, guys and gals, the folks of this wonderful headquarters, came up with absolute greatness in 90 minutes. You know, back brief that to the admiral, staggered by A, the quality, and B, how quick. And then when they briefed it back to their headquarters, who'd been trying to do the same plan, They'd spent days previously, and the quote was, there is blood on the carpet, curtains, and the walls, and we still don't have a good as plan as you guys have come up with. How have you done this? And when they explained how they'd done it, what tools they'd used, but also we'd used our people across the whole diverse group of all ranks, all levels, all ages to come up with this phenomenal plan. And that was a real revelation for them to see that this is a new way of working and thinking and operating that we need to really make part of our protocols going forward. In 90 minutes. 90 minutes. And that's why that's what we mean when we talk about capability. And that capability is so important because that's how you act on the clarity that we talked about before. And if you have the clarity to see what needs to be done, where you need to go, and you have the capability to execute on that, to create robust, resilient plans with optionality baked into them so that they 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 can they can pivot when necessary as you execute them and you have the capability to enable to empower frontline leaders to make adjustments to that as necessary so that that, that it's able to be again agile with a lowercase a and respond to any changes that happen during your execution then you're going to be successful but if you want to be successful in the long run, you really have to focus on culture. Mm -hmm. Because as Peter Drucker famously said, or at least is said to have said, culture eats strategy for breakfast every day. 
So the next time you and I get together, we'll talk about the final C, culture. But let's take a short break right now. And when we come back, as always, when it's Marcus and I without a guest, we will talk about the cognitive bias of the week. And this week, it's going to be optimism bias. Stay tuned. Are you a red team thinker? Are you the person in the room who is always asking the tough questions? Do you see what others don't? Do you find yourself muttering, I told you so, too often after plans have gone awry because nobody listened to your good idea? If so, then you might be. Take our free assessment and find out. There's a link to it in the notes below. I can't wait to see how you score. Welcome back. You know, I was thinking during the break, before we get into this week's cognitive bias discussion, I just want to encourage people to try this tool that we just talked about, yes and. Try it with your team. Try it at work and just see what comes from it. I think you will be amazed at how it helps take a conversation to a different level than you probably would normally have. And it's so simple to do. So I really, I really hope people give that a try. Very simple, very easy to use, but can be very powerful. Another thing too, that just another quick suggestion is something that you can do to make sure that everyone's voice is heard. And this is a tool that I learned from, from a Japanese company. Um, you know, a lot of Japanese companies are, are very hierarchical. And so some of them that are more self-reflective recognize that that's a liability particularly when it comes to surfacing new ideas. So this idea is, is real simple too. When you're having a meeting, when you're discussing something, let people speak in the order of reverse seniority. So the most junior person in the room speaks first and the most senior person in the room speaks last. Again, something that's incredibly simple to do and incredibly powerful, uh, particularly if your organization is one that is normally very hierarchical and rigid. Because what happens in hierarchical organizations is that when the most senior person in the room speaks, everyone else is like, whether they agree with what they said or, or not, is lining up behind that person. Yeah. Set the tone down. Yeah. Straight away. So, so an easy way to disrupt that is to let the most junior person in the room speak. And no no one's going to no one's going to feel any compunction to disagree with the most junior person when they speak. And you get some healthy conversation and then, you know, it's not a threat to your leadership if you're a leader because you're going to speak last. And, you know, but you're going to speak last with the benefit of having heard all that conversation up to that point from your team and that's going to be valuable hugely valuable and not only are you going to get some good suggestions and innovation coming from that group you're going to get people who feel engaged they've gone along to a meeting most of the time they're probably sat there silent and don't speak right and they've got great ideas where now everybody's speaking it's an expectation that whoever's in the room you're there to contribute and you contribute in that order as you talked about and therefore you're not only getting the great output from the individuals but they're feeling like they're part of something and contributing in a valuable way, which which is worth its weight in gold and people really is. Yeah. All right. We, we covered the second C, capability. Let's talk about this week's cognitive bias. And this week, it's my week, I get to pick. I'm going to pick optimism bias. Optimism bias is one of my favorite biases because A, it's one of the most prevalent. And B, it's, it's one that really, I think, illustrates both the danger that cognitive biases pose and the benefit that, that they present, the reason they exist. So let me explain what I mean by that. So optimism bias refers to our tendency, which all of us have to some degree or another, to exaggerate our abilities, to minimize our shortcomings. And also, and this is really important, to exaggerate our ability to accurately predict the future. And so optimism bias is what leads people 
to disregard risk, to plow blindly forward, to be the fool that rushes in where wise men fear to tread. So it's very dangerous. But here's the thing about optimism bias. Daniel Kahneman calls optimism bias the engine of capitalism. Think about that for a sec. The engine of capitalism. And the reason is simple. If we didn't have optimism bias, if we didn't exaggerate our abilities, if we didn't exaggerate our chances of success, if we didn't minimize our, our shortcomings, if we didn't minimize our the risks we face, then nobody would ever start a new business. Nobody would ever open a new restaurant. Nobody would ever try something different because most new things fail. You know, most small businesses that are open in the United States fail within a few years. Nine out of 10 restaurants that open in the United States close in less than five years, less than three years, I think. And, and so if you were approaching it completely rationally, if you were sitting and soberly weighing your odds of success and your chances of failure, you would, if you were a rational person, you would be unlikely to try opening a new business, to try opening a new restaurant, to try innovating in any real way, shape, or form. I mean, think about the Wright brothers. There had been so many people in the in the months and years before uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright took their famous flight at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, that had tried to fly, that had tried powered flight and failed. And many of them died, you know, in their attempts to, to, to try to fly. And so if you're a rational person, if you were a sane person, if you were a, a person who soberly weighed your odds of success and failure, you would never get into this, this you know, kite made of, of wood and, and cloth with a motor attached and try to, to, to plunge off of a cliff into the wild blue yonder. You'd stay at home and, and, and keep working on your bicycle shop, which was doing pretty well. But because of optimism bias, they thought they were going to buck the trend. They were going to be the ones that succeeded where everyone else failed. And they were willing to put their, their successful bicycle business on the line in order to, to try and prove this idea. And guess what? They succeeded and they changed the entire world. They changed the entire world because of optimism bias. And so what Kahneman says is that if we didn't have optimism bias, we would never move forward. It's, it's, it's the engine that drives us forward in terms of innovation, in terms of progress. But here's the thing. It's also the reason why we make a lot of stupid mistakes. It's also the reason why we take a lot of unnecessary risks. And so the problem is not optimism bias. It's that we don't know that it's there. If we know it's there, if we recognize that we all suffer to some degree from optimism bias, then we can factor that into our calculus. We can say, right, I recognize I'm probably being overly optimistic here, but I'm willing to take that risk because I'm confident enough in my idea, in my plan. But here's the things I'm going to do to increase the odds of success in case I'm in case I'm being too optimistic. And so it's not about not taking risks. It's about recognizing things as they are. And that goes back to what we talked about clarity before. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think in business, especially optimism is one of the most effective traits that you can have. Right, as you have alluded to, because if if you don't have that, you're fumbling around in the dark. And, and we've seen, especially in times of crisis, especially now, where we've seen this in the last two years, there are great stories of companies, of groups, of individuals who have seen opportunities, who have been optimistic in the output and their outcomes, and they've gone for it and they've moved forward. Some of them have failed, but they had momentum and they tried. And some of those will be very successful. Whereas others who are almost pessimistic and go, oh, no, this isn't going to work. That's going to fail. Don't even try. And they go into this sort of paralysis where we know there's only one way to go if we're in that position, especially in business. Uh, and I think the key there you mentioned is being optimistic, but not overly so. 
And if you are, recognizing when you are. And like always, putting mechanisms in place. You know, we're going to go for this big bet with this client, or we're going to go and try and build this great big product. Right now, that's an overly optimistic idea. So therefore, what can we do to make sure that it's going to be more successful rather than just going for it? And it's, as always, it's having that foresight, that clarity to do these things as well prepared as you can. And having that optimism almost as well, I think it jives everyone else along with you. You know, you've always got that individual who's overly optimistic on the team. If you just have those reins on each other to pull each other back when needed, to unleash it when you need it, you get a real good combination of different people's perspective and behaviors, but you're all moving forward, which in business, in life today is the key. You have to, you know, a ship doesn't go anywhere if it's in harbor. It can't exactly. move and maneuver unless it's set in sail and going out of those harbor port walls. And I think optimism, understanding it, managing it, recognizing it, and applying it is key. Never, ever put the light out on optimism. You know, no. in children, in, in your operators, in your people. I think it's an awful thing when you see that happen, is quashing that enthusiasm and optimism people often see. But to your point, you can do things not to not to quench that optimism, but to mitigate against the potential that you're you're overestimating your abilities. I'll give you a good example. Um, as you know, Marcus, uh, I am on the board of directors of our, our lighthouse here uh, up the coast from where I live. And it's it's beautiful, beautiful facility, Point Arena Lighthouse. Uh, if anyone wants to come visit, we, you can stay there. It's amazing. It was rated one of the 10 uh, most cool or interesting places to stay on the West Coast um, recently. And it's a historic building. You know, it's it's it was built. You know, the the original lighthouse was built in in 1870, and so it's out on a point, so it's really exposed to the elements and stuff. So maintenance and updating is a constant thing that that we have to be doing out there because it's it's. You spoke about a ship stayed in harbor, a lighthouse. I found out out on a jutting out on a point of land into the Pacific Ocean is kind of like a a ship in and of itself, even though it's connected to to land. But you know, we we so we're constantly doing these renovations of of the lodging there and the other buildings. And in the past, you know, folks who who work out there have said, "Well, you know, we don't need to we 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 can manage this. We can manage um, the construction, the, the the contractors coming in and doing these remodelings and stuff." But you know, there's a bit of an optimism bias in there because these people are doing a lot of other stuff too, and. You know, if you're if you're dealing with contractors who aren't, uh, you know, necessarily doing what they're supposed to do, things can quickly go pear shaped. So one of the things that, that that we on the board suggested to to the staff out there is, you know, you're you're very talented and you guys are doing a great job trying to stay on top of all this, but you have a lot on your plate. So to increase the odds of our our next project being successful, let's hire a project manager who's done this a hundred times and let them ride herd over the contractors, the, 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 the workers who are doing the renovation. And that's been a lot more successful. And that's what I mean about yeah. recognizing how optimism bias comes into play and taking a, a step in this case, a pretty simple step to try to make sure that you're, you're not going too far out on the limb, that you're not overextending yourself. Absolutely. Uh, and in the workplace, where do we see this? You know, I've seen this so often when it's somebody's plan, right? Yeah. We've always had when we get the blue team or you get the boss comes back, go, right, here's the plan. And um, we've talked about this with pre mortem versus risk management. Yes. Yeah, so, so, hey, hey, Bob, tell me about your plan. What could possibly go wrong with your plan? Marcus, nothing. This is a wonderful plan. This is a glorious plan. I've thought of everything. Bob's suffering optimism bias because, of course, he is. It's his baby. He's done all he thinks possibly he could do to make this plan a success. And he's going to hand this beautiful plan off to the team to go and execute. And then when it starts to go wrong, Bob doesn't want to hear about that because it's not Bob's plan that's going wrong. It's your execution. It's your capability or inability to execute my wonderful, deliverable in my plan. A beautiful plan. So if you can help him, absolutely, exactly, the beautiful plan. So if you can help Bob understand that, if you can recognize that in Bob, then you can start to have more effective conversations as you talked about the assumptions challenge. Hey, Bob, can we just go through this? We've got some questions for you. 
we notice this is an assumption. Do you, have you got validation of this becoming a fact downrange or is this wishful thinking? And just those subtle conversations that help people see things differently because you're seeing how they're viewing it in a different way. You're understanding, as I said, self-awareness, but also awareness of others starts to give you this far more insight and capability to discuss and have discourse with people in a far more amenable manner. And therefore, Bob oh, doesn't get upset, does he? That, that's, a, that's such a good point. The ability to, to see yourself and to see others. That reminds me of another tool that we teach called Four Ways of Seeing, which Love is designed to do just Love that. Love this tool. It was developed by the U.S. Army. And uh, I was teaching it. Last night, I was teaching a class in Four Ways of Seeing. And one of the students in our class asked the question. He said, you know, how do you use this tool if your boss doesn't want to doesn't think you need to look and, and, and let me let me back up here this tool is designed to help you look at how another key stakeholder views themselves views you and how both of you view the problem that you're trying to work on so that you can understand things from their perspective and better understand things from your perspective because it goes back to one of my favorite quotes from Sun Tzu which is that you know the the general that that doesn't know himself and doesn't know his enemy is going to fail every time. Indeed. The general that knows himself but doesn't know his enemy is going to have 50-50 chance of success. The general that knows his enemy but doesn't know himself is going to have a 50-50 chance of success. But the general who knows both himself and his enemy is going to succeed every time. So four ways of seeing is designed to give you that perspective. So we were working, I, I taught this and, and one of the students asked, in class, he said, but what if your boss, what if my CEO, he said, doesn't think that that he needs to understand how this looks to another key stakeholder because he's sure that that they're on board already. And my advice to him was, well, you know, because he was like, I don't know how if I go up to him and say, let's do a four ways of seeing analysis on this, he's gonna say we don't need to. They're they're on board. Let's go for it. Optimism bias, right? So my suggestion was. Don't ask. See, I'm a bi- I'm a big believer. If you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna you know break the rules, it's better it's better to to create uh, sins of commission rather than omission. Absolutely. And so I, I I said, don't ask. Just get a get a small group together of your of your team and do a four ways of saying. And then next time you meet with the CEO, rather than trying to pitch him on the need to to spend you know half an hour doing this analysis, just say. Let's use Bob again, like Bob. Uh, say, you know, Bob. Um, I just wanted you to know, I, I I was a little concerned about about how, in this case, it was you know, uh, Team A. We'll call them how Team A is gonna is gonna respond to this idea. And so I asked my group, you know, which had uh, a couple members on it who used to be part of Team A, to do this little analysis. And and here's some insights we came up with that. We're, we're, we think that may give them some anxiety. So if we if we if we can address that anxiety proactively when we announce this plan to them, it's more likely that they'll buy into it and support it. So that's an example of how you can help people overcome their optimism bias in a non-threatening, absolutely non-confrontational way. And you said it again: proactively, pre-mortem. Right. These are all things we're doing before the actual event starts and potentially blows up in your face the minute you push it out and that's the whole purpose of this and if anybody's worried about the time it takes to do these things as we've already talked about some of these tools take minutes a couple of hours you know bigger the problem the longer they can take but just think about how long does it take how much time is wasted when things start to go wrong (laughs) downrange when the wheels come off bob's plan and it's doing 100 miles an hour and the cliff's approaching and it all goes from green to red overnight how long does that take in both time, cost, the impact on your people, the welfare and well-being of all those individuals involved, just taking this time out beforehand to stop and think, have that conversation, assess and analyze these potential biases that we're all impacted by, that's going to save you so much time going forward, believe me. Well, it's, it's you know, what, what, what do our Navy SEALs say here in the U.S.? Slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you if you spend that time, a little bit of time up front, you slow yeah. down a little bit and and 
and check for these biases and check your assumptions and try to spend a few minutes looking at things from different perspectives. Try to spend a few minutes thinking about how your plan could fail and then adjusting based on what, what insights come to you from that. You're going to save yourself from a world of, of problems later on. And it's, it's, it's so valuable. And like you say, it doesn't have to take that long. But, you know, what is, what is my motto? Bad leaders react, good leaders plan, and great leaders think. The world is full of bad leaders. The world is full of bad leaders. And, and what bad leaders do is just plow forward. Mm -hmm. they're, always, they're always putting out fires. They're always reacting to a development in the market, to something their competitor does. They're never taking the time to plan a longer term strategy. They're never taking the time to think three dimensionally about mm -hmm. the problem. And that's so essential. That's so yeah. critical. Totally, totally. And it's that, and because of that, that's that lack of self awareness, lack of situational awareness. And therefore, when things do go off, you have to react because there's nothing else you can do. Whereas, again, if we're going back to being proactive, looking, thinking, planning, discussing, then you're ready, you're aware. And as you mentioned earlier, you've got options to mitigate, you've got options to modify, but you've got options. Doesn't matter what those you've got options, and when you back yourself into a corner because you've not been looking out and not been thinking, and you've been rushing at breakneck speed, you're cutting your options down and down and down until you've got none, and then you're left with nothing, and that's a really dangerous place to be in business. Well, that's a big thing that we're trying to do is give people the capability to create plans with optionality. Because if you have all those options already in place, then if things do, as you said, go go to the right or left. You're not, your hair doesn't catch on fire. You're not panicking. You're like, okay, we knew this was a risk. Here's what we already know what we're going to do about it. And I'm not saying that you can always guard against every risk. There's always going to be, you know, things that you never anticipated, but the more options you have, the more, the more ability you have to pivot and, and you've already know what different moves you could take. Absolutely. And it becomes much more easier to adjust in real time. I know, I know. And one, one of my favorite quotes personally for me is, is slow down to speed up. You know, take that time, uh, stop, breathe, think, you know, and that allows you to respond, doesn't it? Rather than this knee-jerk reaction of reacting system one style. And there's a great quote from Ian Conn. 2018, he was the then CEO of Centrica, which was the big British gas utilities. And I'll read this out verbatim. And he said, it's moving too fast. It is revolution, not evolution. And there are many accelerations at once. And one of the biggest problems is the difficulty of mankind to cope with it. I don't know whether political leaders or business leaders can easily handle it. And I just thought that was such a prophetic statement. And this was pre-COVID. And this was an individual, a leader, you know, who was at the top of his game. They'd made half a billion profit. Look into the future. And he's saying, I can't deal with this anymore. I, as a single CEO at the top, my C-suite, all this stuff going on around us in this VUCA world is going too fast. And it's a big problem that I, and personally, I don't think the group of us can deal with it as an individual and a small C-suite capability. You've got to have this capability that comes from the wisdom of the crowd, your people. And if these overly optimistic people think they can still do this like they used to do in the 90s and noughties, it's not going to end well. No. And and, and 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 that's so true. And, and the world isn't getting any simpler. It's just going to get more and more complex. You know, I mean, right now, you have most people, including most most government leaders, are walking around like COVID's over. And yet, you know, it's not. And you know, we're one mutation away from it being really, really bad again. On top of that, we're now dealing with the economic impact of the past two years of dealing with COVID. But we're also dealing with the economic impact of the war in Ukraine, which is only just beginning to be felt and is going to magnify itself. I just heard last night the 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 uh, the UN says that food prices are already up worldwide thirty seven percent year over year, and, and if you take the time to think about that, thirty seven percent year over year is a staggering, an absolutely staggering number 
for developing countries. It's, it's, it's huge to 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 deal with. Even even you know working class folks in developed countries. If your food costs have gone up thirty seven percent, the immediate impact is people not having enough to eat or or not having disposable yeah. income. But that's just the beginning. That's just the first domino. It's a domino, exactly that. Yeah, and this goes back to something you know. I I, I have a friend who is on the board of one of the biggest companies in the world, one of the biggest tech giants. And early in the pandemic, I asked him, what, what, what are you guys doing? What, how are you planning for COVID? And he laughed and he said, you know what? He said, we're not planning for COVID anymore. He said, COVID's already here. He said, what we're spending our time in our board meetings thinking about is how we're going to respond to the crisis that is triggered by COVID, how we're going to respond to the crisis that's triggered by that crisis, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Because he said, we've looked at this and he said, we're going to spend the next 15, 20, 30 years going from one crisis to another because of all the dominoes that have already been toppled. And so he said, you know, if, if you're still trying to figure out how to deal with COVID, Keep in mind, this was this was a year and a half ago. He says you're too late. You're way behind the drug curve. You're behind. You need to be thinking about how you're going to deal with what's going to come. And, and he was right. Look at look look at how prophetic that was. And there's a reason why that company is still uber profitable. It's not uber. I use that <laughs> I use that term super profitable uh, in its German yeah. German sense. How, why that company is still incredibly profitable despite all the disruptions that have happened is because the leaders of that company like him have been thinking that far down the road. That's the capability that you need to succeed. It is. It is. And, and it's it's quite worrying what you just what you've just said there. You know, the the state of the world and <laughs> well, you know me, oh, little man, Miss Sunshine. Smiling all day. But what's <laughs> worse is when you think about this, you know, look at what we're talking about. We're living in a time now when we are more judgmental. Everybody's bad at listening, if at all. You know, people want to see things in black and white when most of the time we know that the reality we're talking about is very gray. Right. And there's this very much a polarized view of if I'm right, you must be wrong. And there was a great, great chat on LinkedIn today about this perspective of I think this, you think that, this is my opinion, therefore I'm right and you're wrong. And this goes back to what we talked about at the beginning, capability. We're missing so much of this, this human skill that we need, the empathy, this ability to, you know, understand our fellow humans and have these difficult conversations that are needed without falling out with each other. You know, we need more, I mean, we need yeah. more of this quality level of understanding, appreciation, because if we don't, you know, it, it's going to lead us into a very bad place because of all these things going on in the world you talked about, it needs us to come together and have this discussion, this discourse, this you know dialogue that's essential because if we don't, we can't solve it on our own. As Ian Conn said. Right. You know, and, and when we talk about capability, that's one of the capabilities that we're talking about is giving people the tools they need, not just to, to think critically, but also to disagree agreeably. To disagree agreeably. That's a that's a that's a Dale Carnegie principle that, that Dale Carnegie was teaching a hundred years ago. But it's something that's so hard for people to do. And it's harder for people to do today than it was 100 years ago is, is to be able to disagree with each other without demonizing each other, without fighting each other. Social media's caused this. People's behaviors have caused this. There's a reason we're not on Facebook. <laughs> how do we take it forward? And you talked about you know disagreeing agreeably. I love how when, when we're teaching Devil's Rock, we talk about the art of contradiction. And it, and it is an art. Right. You know, to be able to have that good conversation with someone and to disagree and to have opposing views and still walk out and go for a beer together afterwards and not fall out and not want to not talk to each other again. That's not a good thing to do. You know, you need to be able to have this discussion, this disagreement, be, as we say, professionally provocative. Right. And the other person has to accept that and understand that and then come back at you with their viewpoint. Because this is what, for me, is about being human. I love those discussions. You know, we get together and we're, I can't wait to see you in, in London when you come over in summer because... We can go out for a drink, have some good Indian food and start sparring, you know, verbally and mentally and just have exactly. some good conversation because that's what it's all about. But if the minute someone opens their mouth and you take offense or you disagree and storm out or shut them down, you know, yeah, you, know, you may say something. I disagree. I go, yes, and Bryce, can you explain a bit more? Or yes, and 
how do you believe that could become a better thing than it is right now? And using these simple words and techniques that diffuse a situation but keep the dialogue going. And I think that's one of the things that's sorely lacking as a capability for humans today. And we need to help with that. I, I couldn't agree more. Well, something to look forward to. Can't wait. Can't wait. Where are we going next? Well, next week we have another exciting guest coming on our show. So you don't have to listen to us talk as much. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. And I hope you practice. Yes, and. Give it a try. Tell us in the comments what you think of it. How did it work? You try the reverse hierarchy method I talked about too, if that's appropriate in your organization. And again, let us know in the Absolutely. comments how it worked, what happened. Love to talk. Marcus, it's always a pleasure. I will see you next week. We'll see you next week. We'll talk to you next week and uh, keep asking the tough questions. Thank you for tuning in to Red Team TV, sponsored by Red Team Thinking. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and notification icon below so you don't miss the next idea-filled episode. If you prefer to listen on the go, subscribe to Bryce and Marcus's podcast, The Thinking Leader, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen. And don't forget to visit redteamthinking.com to learn more about Red Team Thinking work and Marcus and Bryce's upcoming online courses. While you're there, take our free quiz to find out how you rate as a red team thinker and if your organization has a red team culture. Because who thinks wins?